Summary of Weep Not, Child by Ngugi Wa Thayongo. And George lives in the middle of Kenya with his family. Nayo Kabi, his mother, tells him when he is a little boy that he will be the first person in the family to go to school. Nayo Kabi is so happy that he runs to Kamau and tells him the good news. He is thrilled that Kamau will get an education. And George has a half brother named Kamau because their father, Notho, has another wife named Njeri. Kamau is happy for his younger brother in George that he is going to school. He and George then talk about their plans and how both going to school and getting an apprenticeship as a carpenter will help their family. Soon after, George gets together with his family in the evening to hear his dad tell stories from the past. Notho talks to his neighbors Kamau and George, as well as their wives and youngest kids Burrow and Cory. He then tells them the story of how he and other Kenyans lost their land to white settlers. By saying that he joined the British Army during World War I, he means that he was quickly taken from his home to help build roads in Kenya during the war. He says that the whole time, he was looking forward to going back home and getting whatever reward the white invaders would give him and his people for taking part in a war that wasn't even about the Kenyans. But when he finally got back, he found that white colonists had kicked his family off the land where they had grown up and taken over the farm where they made a living. Because he and his father couldn't do anything else, they lived as mohoi, serfs, and worked on land that used to belong to them while they waited for white people to leave Kenya. This day never came though, and Ngotho's father died a mohoi. Notho tells the people who are listening to his story that there is one good thing about it, an old Gikuyu prophet said that the land would be given back to its true owners one day. But when Burrow says this, he sounds sarcastic and rude. Burrow is a quiet, mean man who hates both the white farmers and his elders because he thinks they didn't protect the land when his brother died in World War II. Burrow cuts off his father's story and says, to hell with the prophecy. He is sick of waiting for this prediction to come true. How can you keep working for someone who took your land? What else can you do to serve him? And George starts school in the middle of all this trouble. Some boys pick on him on his first day, but Mohaki, who is from the same town as N. George and whose sister Lucia is a teacher, stops them. Also, Mohaki's dad, Hakobo, owns a lot of land and is the richest black person in the area. As soon as Mohaki helps N. George fight off bullies, he becomes interested in her. The two kids become close friends and both love going to school. However, this is also the time when Notho and Hakobo's bitter rivalry grows as they argue over how to handle a worker's strike. For his part, Notho feels forced to join the strike because Burrow has said that he isn't doing enough to get back their family's land. He doesn't think it's a good idea to quit working for the white farmers, though, because if he does, he will lose his job at Mr. Howland's farm, which was once Ngotho's land. In fact, Notho works for Mr. Howland's because he wants to keep working on the land he used to own. When there are rumors of a strike, Mr. Howland's tells his workers that he will fire them if they join the movement. Still, Notho can't hold back his anger when he learns at a village meeting that Hakobo has joined the white farmer's side. Hakobo walks to the front of the group with a few white police officers and tells his people not to strike. This makes Notho so angry that he gets up and goes toward Hakobo. Villagers follow him and beat Hakobo. He then runs away, but not before a police officer hits him in the face with a stick. People begin to talk about Jomo Kenyatta, a politician who they think will help get rid of the white settlers after this event. Jomo has been caught though, and even though everyone thinks he will be set free after his hearing, this is not the case. Because of this, everyone in George's village feels less hopeful. As for George's family, they have to leave Hakobo's land, so they move to Nganga's land, Nana is Kamau's carpentry master. While this is going on, Burrow and Cory move to Nairobi, where Burrow becomes even more angry about how the white immigrants treat the natives badly. Kenyans and white settlers are becoming more hostile toward each other as George continues to go to school. This is especially true as the Mau Mau, a violent group fighting against the colonialists, tries to find new members. As the years go by, Notho has a harder time taking care of his family. 
Things get even worse when Hakobo is made village chief and Mr. Howlands is made a directing officer of the Home Guard, which is the colonial police force. In order to find people who have joined the Mau Mau, Hakobo now goes from house to house with armed guards. This is around the time that Burrow and Cory join the Mau Mau and become more involved in politics. Since Notho attacked Hakobo, Burrow has been mean to his dad, saying that his hasty choice only made things worse. Because he is constantly criticized, Notho is quieter around his son and lets Burrow talk over him because he feels bad. But when Burrow tries to get him to swear allegiance to the Mau Mau, he says no. Soon, and George pass the tests to get into a good high school. Because Muhaki goes to a high school far away and their families are enemies, he and Muhaki don't go to the same school anymore and don't see each other very often. But she asks him to spend time with her one time when she's home on break. During this meeting, she asks him to come to her house, and he says yes, even though he isn't sure. When he gets there, he has a rough talk with Hakobo, but the man is nice to him and tells him that he hopes and George does well in school so that he can rebuild the country. After that, Wihaki takes him to a hill and tells him she's scared of all the trouble going on around them. And George tries to make her feel better by telling her that sunshine always follows a dark night. Because he seems so positive, Wihaki asks him to run away with her. He says he can't leave his family when things are so bad, but she doesn't accept her offer. The Mau Mau gets more and more violent as it tries to get more members. Eventually, it becomes a threat to the people it wants to protect. This makes Mr. Howlands very happy because he loves it when Black Kenyans fight and hurt each other. During this time, Hakobo gets back at Ngotho's family by using his power as chief. In order to do this, he tries to jail both Burrow and Cory, but only Cory gets away. He captures Cory when he walks outside after curfew with Njeri, who is also jailed but gets out quickly unlike Cory. Men with guns who work for Mr. Howlands one day pull N. George out of his new school that looks like one in Europe. He is then taken to Mr. Howlands and abused there. What does Mr. Howlands ask N. George after he asks him where Burrow is and if N. George has taken the Mau Mau oath? Who killed Hakobo? If N. George doesn't answer, Mr. Howlands gets a pair of pincers and presses them against the boy's crotch, telling him, you'll be castrated like your father. As in George yells, Mr. Howlands tells him that Notho has already admitted to killing Hakobo. But N. George passes out from pain before he can say anything. After a few days, N. George gets better, and he and his two moms, who were also being held, are freed. Not long after that, N. George sees his dad in the family hut. His head hurts so badly that he can barely talk, but when he sees in George, he thinks that his son has come to make fun of him because he hasn't been able to protect his family as a father. It looks like Burrow came into the town from the woods, killed Hakobo, and then vanished again. Being aware that Mr. Howlands would likely think Kamau was the one who killed Hakobo, Notho got the guts to tell the police that he was the one who did it. Still, Mr. Howlands knew that the man was only trying to protect his son after beating and castrating Notho. He let Notho go, even though he had wanted to kill him since the workers strike. Burrow shows up at the front door of the hut just as Notho is about to die. Pardon me, father. I didn't know, oh, I thought, stutters Burrow. He begs his father to forgive him, I had to fight. Notho says, all right, as he tries hard to get up on one arm. Do a good job. He lies down and dies, telling his son to turn his eyes to God. Then Burrow runs off again. So he sneaks into Mr. Howlands' office and tells him that he killed Hakobo. He then shoots Howlands in the head. Burrow shoots as many police officers as he can on his way out before he is caught and taken away. After this fight, police hold Kamau, making it three people in police custody, Corey, Burrow, and Kamau. Because of this, N. George is the only brother left, and he doesn't have any money to pay for school. Because of this, he works in a market for an Indian man and feels bad all the time because everyone who sees him knows what happened to him and his family. He goes to see Muhaki because he thinks she is his last chance at hope after being fired. When they finally meet, 
he tells her he loves her and wants them to run away. But Mohaki says no, telling in George that he needs to keep his hope for a better future. To make matters worse, she won't run away with him, leaving him upset and lost. He feels so hopeless that he leaves his house the next night and goes to a certain tree, where he makes a noose and gets ready to hang himself. But just as he was about to kill himself, he heard Nayo Kabi's voice calling his name from the road. He goes out to meet her, even though he feels bad about not finishing school and has no hope for the future. They meet in Jerry on the way home, and as the three of them walk home, and George thinks about why he didn't follow through with his plan to kill himself. A voice inside him says, because you are a coward. He says, yes. I'm a coward. He runs home and opens the door for his mom after saying this. About the author. Ngugi Wathayamo was born in central Kenya in the late 1930s. He came from a family that suffered during the war between British colonialists and the Kenyaland Freedom Army, which included Ngugi as half-brother. He went to one of the first high schools in Kenya to teach Africans and then to Makarari University in Uganda, where he wrote and performed his first play. Shinua Achebe read drafts of Ngugde's first two books, The River Between and Weep Not, Child, during this time. Achebe was so moved by Ngugde's writing that he helped put out the author's first few books as an advice editor. Ngugi gave up his Christian name, James Ngugi, and became a Marxist in 1967. Nine years later, he went to jail after writing Gahik and Dienda, which means I will marry when I want. While he was in jail, he chose to stop writing in English and instead wrote Devil on the Cross in the Gakuyu language. Ngugd is a strong opponent of colonialism who has been an activist and author for many years. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.